Kathleen. Hey. Welcome to another episode of The Healthy Podcast. I'm Dr. Jesse Abend, and that is Kathleen Escanio, a registered dietitian. So today we'll be talking about uh, different types of diets. I wanted to make a diet series, um, and in this one, we'll be talking about the carnivore diet as it's a very popular diet now, and I wanted to sort of break it down, go into it, understand what it is, if it's something you should do or shouldn't do, uh, the benefits and risks, and sort of look at it uh, myself in an objective view and sort of teach you uh, more about what it actually is. Yeah, I'm excited. This one's gaining a lot of traction, so I'm really excited to talk about it. Yeah, and I learned a lot looking into it, so I'm excited to talk about it as well. And uh, we'll get right into it then. So yeah. what is the carnivore diet and is it a healthy diet? Is it a type of diet that you should be uh, eating and consuming? So so what is the carnivore diet? Uh, so it's it looks like it's a strictly an animal-based diet. Uh, it looks like you can also consume fruits, um, uh, except uh, vegetables, grains, anything other than uh, animal-based products. And some fruits are completely off limits. Yeah. And even some dairy um, is actually considered off limits as well. Uh, which type of dairy products have you heard? Uh, primarily just like milk and yogurt, but like cheese and butter, but more of the hard cheeses, um, I guess would be okay to eat on this kind of diet. Yeah. I think more like the raw dairy products. If, yeah. Um, yeah. Butter, raw milk. Um, Lard sounds yeah. delicious. <laughs> Have you ever had lard? Uh yeah, yeah. Okay, is it? It's just fat. It's just yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. That, um, I mean, it definitely gives certain things like a different mouthfeel and flavor, but um, yeah. All right. Um. So the I looked into the theory of the carnivore diet, kind of understanding uh, how it came to be, why people are into it. Uh, and think it is a type of diet that we should be ascribing uh, to. And essentially, I think uh, what it is and how it came to be is that it's based on what our ancestors ate um, right. and understanding that our ancestors, were, maybe they were probably in better physical shape than we are in now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you? Yeah. So, I mean, you just think about like hunters and gatherers and nomads and they were on the move and, you know, um, I guess in certain times of the year, they could only get meat or animal products. So um, from my understanding, it's the same, you know, they just eating as if your primal ancestors did. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you see pictures of them. They're jacked. They're in good shape. Yeah. They're walking miles. So I get it. I get the appeal. Uh, <laughs> most of us are not like that anymore. No. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, when you say it, it makes sense when you hear it like that. I get it. Um, so looking further into the theory, I learned that, um, I think proponents of, of the theory, I'm not sure if it's everyone who talks about the carnivore diet, but I see that, uh, they tend to talk about how vegetables are dangerous and maybe harmful to health. So that was interesting to me because that's not something I'm aware of. I don't, I didn't know much about how vegetables could be harmful. So I obviously looked into it. Um, uh, did you see that as well? And yeah, that they were. I mean, harmful, which again, kind of goes far against my understanding of vegetables. Um, so it was really interesting to get that perspective, if you will, on how they can have a negative impact on your health. Yeah, it's certainly a different perspective. It's not something I was ever taught or I learned. Uh, and I know you were not as well. Um but it's good to look into and see all sides, in, in my opinion, um, because there are always things that we don't know. Um, and uh, so who knows? Um, so we can get right into it. So I'll I'll start with the vegetables because that's sort of something I started. I, I thought that that was a, the main difference of this type of diet is leaving out the vegetables and saying that they may be harmful. So I kind of looked into it a little bit um, and I found there are a few substances in vegetables that the carnivore diet. Uh, and proponents of the diet tend to say may be harmful to health. And that includes such substances such as lectins, uh, phytates or phytic acid, oxalates or oxalic acid, glycoalkaloids, sulforaphane, and phytochemicals. 
Um, I'm not sure if these are all the substances that they uh, tend to say are harmful in vegetables, but these seem to be the main ones. I did, I did a small amount of research into these and what, what exactly they are, and we can go through it. Um, I thought yeah. that would be a good idea. I agree. Let's do it. Uh, so lectins. Uh, lectins are uh, found in most plants like potatoes, beans, tomatoes, eggplants, lentils, chickpeas, peanuts, chilies, bananas. <laughs> so they're found in, in a lot. Um, they occur yeah. in nearly all foods, uh, but are highest in legumes and grains. Um, yeah. So it can be part part of um, almost like a jelly factor, if I'm not mistaken. It can make things a little thick. All right. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, they they're they're what they're called a type of carbo carbohydrate binding protein. So I guess mm -hmm. it's a it's a protein that binds the carbohydrates and perhaps makes the substance thick, thick. Um, and so lectins also seem to be involved in the plant's innate defenses against insects and other herbivores that try to eat it and kill it, which uh, I guess it makes sense uh, since and I, I think I heard someone else in the carnivore realm speak about this, and I'm willing to listen, is that uh, plants really don't have much, much defense as far as keeping uh, others and insects and predators from eating it. it it's just a stationary uh, living. Uh, so instead, it produces uh, these types of chemicals that can deter um, insects and herbivores from eating it. And I guess mm -hmm. a lectin is a type of chemical that can do that. Um, and supposedly, uh, they may be harmful to humans. Uh, they are resistant to your body's digestive enzymes and can pass through your stomach unchanged. Uh, the thing is, so they seem to be found more in raw, raw vegetables, like raw kidney beans contain something called phytohemagglutinin, which is a toxic lectin. Uh, and actually, yeah. if you eat raw kidney beans, uh, you can become poisoned and have severe abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, however, uh, when these beans are cooked, they seem to be completely safe. Yep. Yeah. So I've heard of that as well. So consuming like raw beans or undercooked beans, um, like, but that's if they're the hard bean. You know, if you get it from the can, it's fine because it's already cooked and processed. But like a hard bean, if you just pop it in, um, undercooked or raw, you can definitely get sick. Um, and it's probably the lectin, but, you know, cooking it, you know, does do some chemical change to it and then it is safe. And that is actually with a lot of food, you know, you think about protein or like raw chicken we don't go around eating raw chicken because of, you know, foodborne illnesses, your chance of getting salmonella dramatically increases. Um, so when we cook it, it kills bacteria and now it's safe for us to eat. Yeah. And it, um, it just seems again, I feel like our bodies kind of know if something is safe and good to eat in the taste in the way we feel after we consume it. And after we cook it, I mean, these beans taste delicious. We don't have issues. So it would make sense that we would cook this possible poison off. And now we're able to consume this uh, vegetable. Um, you know, whether or not, I, I think the proponents of this diet would still say these lectins still remain in the food and uh, over time they can cause damage. I don't know. Um, but just kind of looking at things how they are. Uh, yeah. And supposedly, and, and, and I think you're always going to find studies of all different sides when it comes to, you know, especially nutrition. Uh, yeah. So there's going to be pros and cons. Some studies uh, I, I saw, they link lectins to diseases like Parkinson's and neurodegenerative effects. Um, but again, these are just a few studies and you just don't know. It's hard. Yeah. But you know, on the flip side that there's also brain protective properties of some of those foods as well. So it's, you know, uh, it would have to examine like how much are they eating? You know, again, is it an undercooked product? Is it raw? Is it, you know, um, so it's, it's really hard to kind of sift through that information and see like, is, does that really cause that? Or is it just kind of associated with it? People who have Parkinson's disease, like, were they consuming a lot of beans? We don't know, you know? Yeah. I mean, these are, these associations are so difficult to make because there are so many factors uh, right. and that sometimes 
you know, you can, you can put a lot of associations together for many different things. Um, and, and there are so many benefits to vegetables. Uh, so that's the thing, like, yes, there's, yeah, you know, you have to look at also the other side as well. Um, another type of, po- uh, uh, possible, um, uh, compound that the carnivore establishment uh, says may be harmful or something called phytates or phytic acid. Um, so what's great is I get to kind of learn more about this too as well. So I get to learn that these chemicals are in plants and learn more about them. So it's interesting on my end. Um, but phytic acid uh, is found in plant seeds. Uh, they supposedly, it's the main storage of phosphorus that's used in plant growth. Um, and all edible seeds, grains, legumes, and nuts contain this phytate, uh, and small amounts are also found in roots and tubers. Uh, so phytic acid, now this is where the carnivore diet and proponents of it say uh, where phytic acid is bad, is that it prevents the absorption of certain uh, vitamins and minerals into your body, it prevents the absorption of zinc, iron, calcium, and other minerals. Um, however, uh, what I've read and come across is that this doesn't happen over your entire lifetime. It just happens if you eat seeds or, or something that contains a phytic acid, it may prevent the absorption of these nutrients in that single meal. Sometimes they're referred to as an anti-nutrient. Have you heard about anti-nutrients? Um, not that term specifically, but I have heard of um, some nutrients blocking the absorption of others. But again, like you're having to look at quantity, you know? Does one single nut or seed block the absorption of like all the zinc and iron? Not likely, no. But now if I were to eat a solid, you know, pound or so of seeds, which sounds uncomfortable and it likely is, it would that block some absorption? Yes. You know, so kind of taking it in that perspective that while it could do it, you're not likely to get any sort of effect in any meal because you're not eating the quantity that's needed to block that kind of absorption. Mm -hmm. So in moderation, like I think with anything, you know, you you tend to get benefits, but obviously if you consume too much of everything, there probably always is a negative net effect. And uh, so, yeah, I could certainly see exactly what you're saying. Um, You know, and. mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean you have seeds, grains, legumes, nuts, and all amazing things that have, you know, heart protective, brain protective properties, tons of vitamins and minerals, along with like proteins and, you know, fats. So all things that would be essential for a healthy diet. Yeah, there's so many benefits uh, to everything you just said. Um, And yes, maybe sometimes it's found that it may produce the absorption of certain minerals, but there are other uh, nutrients that you'll be getting as well. And who knows if even this prevention of absorption of these minerals is a bad thing. Maybe it's something that has to happen in order for some uh, chemical reaction to happen here, but I don't know. It's complex, Uh, but it's, you're you're kind of just looking at one certain thing. We just don't know. Um, uh, You can reduce phytic acid in foods though, if you soak them, if you sprout them through fermentation. So again, there are ways to get rid of these potential chemical, um, uh, chemicals and uh you know prepare them in a way that we can eat them and then take in all the nutritional benefits yep i have heard of sprouting um like lentils and legumes before eating them um it's process um and i'm not quite entirely sure you know if there's any danger that comes along with that i don't say danger but if there's any negative effects that come along with sprouting you know i mean you do leave things in water you know, my first thought is, you know, some sort of toxin accumulating or is the sprout safe to consume in and of itself? We know that there are some um, populations that can't eat sprouted food, like, you know, immunocompromised pregnant women, young children. So, you know, having to look on that spectrum as well. So like you said, this is very complicated. It's very complex and yeah. may not apply to everyone either. Yeah. It- uh, things get so complex sometimes in the diet world. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk more, more about that after we're done going through these uh, chemicals. So uh, oxalate or oxalic acid. Um, another one found in many plants, including the leafy greens, vegetables, fruits, cocoa, nuts, seeds. 
uh, oxalates bind to minerals and form compounds and supposedly have been linked to increased risk of kidney stones and other health problems. Um, as a doctor, we actually do learn that most of the kidney stones are actually made up of calcium oxalate. Um, uh, one of the other main concerns is that oxalate can bind to minerals in the gut and prevent the body from absorbing them. So I think much like uh, the previous phytates we were talking about, it's uh, considered an anti-nutrient, uh, supposedly. Um, uh, they may be, again, controversial uh, research shows they may have been linked to other health problems like autism and unexplained vaginal pain or vulvodynia. But the oh. support is a weak. <laughs> and um, again, I, I don't know, just things I've come across. Uh, however, uh, to your side, as you always like to point out, uh, a lot of foods that have these oxalates are also very healthy for you and contain a lot of other nutrients as well. Beet greens. Have you ever had beet, the greens of the beets? I have. Yeah, we use them all the time. They're delicious. Uh, rhubarb, spinach, beets, Swiss chard, Swiss chard, another, I really enjoy that green as well. Uh, cocoa powder, sweet potatoes. I, I, I eat a lot of sweet potatoes, put some yeah. cinnamon on it, some olive oil. Yep. But, but yeah, no, again, all great things for your body and to make up a very healthy diet. So, um, interesting that it's considered dangerous, but again, I would, again, consider the quantity, you know, are you eating 10 pounds of spinach at a time? No, that's exactly. like some weird things happening. Exactly. I mean, I think if anything, what I may take away from this and other people may take away is just the quantity and, and realizing that even something as healthy as vegetables, everything can be uh, bad for you if not taking in the appropriate amount, if, if right. consuming too much of anything. Right, right. It's almost like a life law. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I do feel like though with like vegetables, it's, uh, it's going to be impossible for you to get that amount. You know what I'm saying? Like for a carrot to become toxic, like you just cannot consume that much, you know? So, um, so far I want to say that vegetables are safe. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, glycoalkaloids. Uh, another potentially toxic family of chemical compounds found in the nightshade family of plants, potatoes, okay. tomatoes, peppers. Um, do you know why they're called nightshades? Um, I want to believe it's um, something to do with the sun setting and they open and close appropriate, like with the sun, I think. So glycoalkaloids can be toxic if consumed in high amounts. Um, this was an interesting chemical I actually came across because I did find some of this uh, information on a government website, the Canada government website, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, however, when these foods are consumed in normal amounts, glycoalkaloids are unlikely to cause negative effects, potentially. Um, cooking, however, does not significantly reduce these glycoalkaloids. So that, that's what was interesting about these, these substances. So what I actually got from the Canada government governmental website is uh, they recommended when it comes to potatoes, because they they can have potentially uh, toxic levels of these glycoalkaloids. So in order to prevent uh, this, uh, focus on storing in a cool, dry, dark environment to mi minimize this glycoalkaloid formation, cut away parts of the potato that's shown with this greening. So it seems to be where like potatoes usually the greening and I think those little eye, the eyes are like the sprouts that come out of it. You want to okay. cut those away because that is what contains these chemicals. Um, similar to tomatoes, it, it recommends to stay away or eat in moderation green tomatoes and consume tomatoes when they're ripe uh, as they don't have as much glycoalkaloid. And um don't consume the green parts of the tomato plant, the stems, the leaves. So I, I seem to pick up some, some almost more serious information when it came to this substance. Have you heard about this? Yes. Now I have heard of the skin of the potato. If it's green, you do want to cut that away um, because that is where the toxin is. And of course the eyes, I didn't, or those little buds or sprouts. Um, I didn't realize that's what that was. It's just something growing up, you know, my grandma was always like, you got to cut that part off. Um, so now we really cut it off. Um, and same thing with the tomato stems and leaves that I've heard that that is toxic. 
Um, and I would have imagined by now, maybe through some sort of genetic modifying, you know, growing or, you know, selecting that they, that would have been taken care of or remedied, but, um, I'm still not going to go chomping down the plate made a plant. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting one. Uh, yeah. Next, uh, sephorophane, Uh This is a natural plant compound found in many cruciferous veggies like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and kale. Personally, mm-hmm. I enjoy all these vegetables. Same. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Very disappointed to hear if I did want to go carnivore, I could no longer have these vegetables. Yeah. Um, so uh, this, so there's almost like two extreme sides to this one. Unlike the other ones is I actually read, there's a lot of research showing that sephirophanes actually have health benefits um, to, to your body, such as heart health and digestion. Um, however, on the other side, uh, the carnivore proponents state that this chemical is actually very harmful to health due to its oxidative, oxidative and free radical effects. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, so, you just don't hear of, you know, vegetables having free radicals and you know they're supposed to you know help get rid of free radicals in your body yeah and supposedly so the sephirophane is activated when the plant's destroyed or broken uh which i guess would make sense from a chemical uh plant perspective for defensive purposes if something came in um but again if you know i know when you cook these vegetables cooking tends to neutralize a lot of these chemicals. I'm not exactly sure how much it does with sulforaphane, but you know, broccoli is a lot different eating raw uh, versus cooked. Uh, to me, I actually don't really enjoy maybe like raw vegetables. Um, I think it's a personal preference, but you know, I prefer broccoli is cooked. It's just uh, through experience. It's a lot easier to uh, eat. Uh, it tastes better. Um, I agree. And those are almost almost signs to me like this is then something I'm safe to eat because I can consume it. I'm not having issues. Whereas maybe consuming it raw, the reason it's not appealing is because maybe there are some negative aspects to eating it raw. Interesting. Yeah, that might be. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, next, phytochemicals. Uh, natural chemicals produced. So phytochemicals this is another one. There's like, you, you hear a very good side to phytochemicals. And then you have this negative side uh, in this carnivore camp. Uh, these are natural chemicals produced by plants that keep them healthy and protect them from insects and, and the sun. So another defense mechanism that, that makes sense intuitively to me. Um, and then phytochemicals are said to provide us humans with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. Other side looking in, you have the proponents of the carnivore diet saying these chemicals are actually harmful. There's a there's a net negative effect when you eat these vegetables, and um, it's not worth it. Uh, and co- common phytochemicals that we've all, that most of us have heard of, are carotenoids that are good <laughs> for our eyes, uh, resveratrol. Uh, that, I remember, you know, often they'll market that with wine and the benefits of drinking wine. I think that's yeah. a bit of a of a reach and a marketing aspect, but resveratrol is found in grapes. You don't have to drink wine. Um, and then flavonoids. Yes. Again, it's one of those things where, you know, all through my schooling, that is, is those are one of the key benefits of your vegetables and fruits even because they do help with the free radicals and, you know, they are, heart protective, brain protective, and just how so many benefits. So again, it's interesting to, that there's this subset of people who claim that these are negative for your health. And yeah, I have some ideas and opinions on it. So we'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So now I just kind of wanted to cover those uh, main compounds and perhaps I'm probably missing more and maybe I'm missing more aspects of the carnivore diet. However, that stood out to me as I think one of the main differentiating parts of their theory that separated it from other types of, of diets. And I wanted to hit on that. Uh, so let's go into the potential benefits of a meat only diet because there are benefits. Um, you know, I, I, in meat, especially now, 
I, I like to, when I eat meat, first of all, I always like to appreciate where it's coming from because uh, it's an, it was a live animal uh, that is now uh, killed so that I can take it in and continue to live because of what that animal gave me. And I think that we're so separated from our food that we don't really realize that everything that comes, we eat comes from a living creature or the earth. So it's important to put that into perspective so that you don't waste food and you appreciate where it's coming from and the nutrition that you're able to get from it. Uh, so I do always like to, um, if I'm eating animal products, I like to make sure it's um, a humanely raised product, a grass fed, grass finished. It was able to live a life on a uh, pasture and, and live as well as it could be. Um, right. Not always easy to come by, but there are a lot of good companies and services that can provide you with that. Uh, and in animal products, they provide you so many nutrients that you need to survive. Yes, definitely. Obviously, protein being the biggest one. Um, and we've talked about it before. Those um, essential amino acids that your body needs, you know, it's the building blocks. It's what makes your body a body. So you you need it. And it's, you know, those animal products are the easiest you know, definite way to get all those amino acids and not even to mention, you're still getting a ton of other nutrients, right. That you don't always get through vegetables, you know, iron being a very big one and that your body actually absorbs iron easier from meat products rather than, you know, plant sources. Yep. Amino acids, protein is so important. And then the iron was an excellent, uh, other example of an important nutrient that you can't really get from other sources. Um, so animal products are beneficial, uh, very important for you. Not to say you can't get nutrients in, in non-animal pro products, but they have a lot of uh, good benefits. So now there are going to be maybe some variable opinions on, can you get all of your nutrients from meat versus do you have to supplement or do you have to eat vegetables and other products to get those um, proponents I've seen of the, of the carnivore diet uh, state that you can get all those nutrients that would of course um, have you including organ meats as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you eat organ meats? No, but I would love to, but I just can't, I can't seem to find any. Okay. Uh, it's not my favorite. So if, I mean, I guess if it was the only way I would have to get these nutrients, maybe I could do it. Um, I think it's definitely a mind over matter kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. If you're going to have to, if you're going to get everything that your body a hundred percent needs, you're going to have to be eating some parts of the animal that you likely wouldn't find at the regular grocery store. Um, or you would have to be looking at taking some supplements just to make sure you check all of your boxes. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Um, it's going to be like, a, if you look on the opposite end of the spectrum, which we've talked about before, like a vegan diet is you do have to be um, more careful and uh, more studious in, in what you're eating and, and have a lot more um, focus on that. Absolutely. But it may be, but it may be possible with some extra uh, work. Yes. Um, so, and, and here's the point, which is why carnivore is probably so successful in people who do start it is that I think this is this is a secret with any type of diet you throw out there. Carnivore, um, plant-based, uh, keto, anything. When someone goes, when the average person, American, goes from their typical diet to this type of diet, this new type of diet is always probably healthier for them than their old way of eating because most of us don't have the healthiest habits and we're typically eating a lot of processed foods, carbohydrates. Um, and so if you do switch to a carnivore diet, yeah, there, there's so much better. You've already cut out all the processed food, which is probably what was causing your initial diet to be so unhealthy. And you're probably going to lose weight because now you're not eating as much as you once once was. So you get all these benefits right up front, which is what makes people so um, uh, impressed with it. Right, right. And again, I mean, you're cutting out a whole chunk of, you know, calories so yeah you are going to lose weight protein is more filling so you are likely going to eat less um you know and i just wonder for the long term because this although our primal ancestors ate like this you know thousands of years ago or however long ago 
this whole taking it and putting it in this era is relatively new for us, you know? So we don't exactly know what are the long-term effects here? You know, if somebody just ate meat, what, what would happen? You know, we don't really know. It's not studied. We don't. And a lot of the claims, you know, I have read claims of people saying, oh, well, this was cured and this got better. Well, it could be secondary to the weight loss. You know, it could be secondary to cutting out all the processed foods or the carbs. We don't know. And, you know, but we also don't know what their long-term effect is. You know, um, I hear the cholesterol. We know that what we eat doesn't necessarily direct directly affect your cholesterol. It's more genetics and things like that. Um, you know, but it's, I mean, you're looking at a heart healthy diet where they're kind of scaling back on red meats. Well, if you're eating a carnivore diet, red meat's likely going to be a major factor here. Not the only meat, of course, but you know, what, what does that do? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. And I think, again, to a point of uh, always eating in moderation or excess, if now we're excessively eating a lot of meat, I think just like if we excessively ate a lot of vegetables or anything else, you're probably going to have some uh, negative effects. Right. And I think on the flip side, like you said, eating a lot of vegetables, I think the negative effects would happen like way longer. With <laughs> you know, like you could sustain that for much longer than a carnivore diet in my opinion yeah my opinion. So. perhaps perhaps um yeah i mean if you eat too much meat you can certainly take in too much fat and too many nutrients where it's now it starts to harm your health um yeah. and too much protein can actually overload the kidneys so you know you have to match it with water intake and sometimes that's hard for a lot of people to do just on a regular basis so a lot of things to consider here. Yeah. And just to say where I'm coming from, because I'm trying to be biased and everyone is absolutely different. But the way I personally eat is I eat meat and I eat vegetables and I really eliminate really all processed foods. Everything I typically is is cooked. Um, and I drink water. Um, <laughs> by, I incorporate everything and I do incorporate whole grains as well. Uh, you know, sometimes it makes a great, you know, a uh, meal to uh, eat prior to a workout gives me some energy. Um, and I think there are nutritional benefits from, from that diversity of foods. It's not to say that the carnivore diet isn't the right way of eating for some people. Maybe it is, but who knows? But I think now getting into the reality of, of, of this and, and the sustainability factor of now living in the real world in the year 20, almost 2023, is that realistic? Can you do it? Yeah. Can you do it? You know, I mean, and what does this even do? And where do the fun things come in? You know, it's, um, do you just stay in your house and you just eat your meat and that's it. You don't go to birthday parties. You don't have fun. You don't go out and, you know, and again, like, can you, can you realistically do that? You know, I think short term, yes. Long term, it's going to be difficult. Um, and probably costly, you know, you, I go to the grocery store and I look at the price of meat now and I'm like, e that's expensive, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You take into, um, you know, the financials absolutely in, into the equation. Um, now so many people, they see these new types of diets and they stop everything they're, they're eating. They stop what they're doing and they jump right into it. Now that's the, the biggest problem I have is not necessarily with these diets themselves, because like I said, they're probably healthier than what they were currently eating. But regardless of any diet you choose, whether it's a carnivore or vegan or whatever, it's never going to be sustainable because you can't just drop everything you're eating and then now pick up a brand new lifestyle, a brand new way of eating. Some people, yes, they can. It's rare. Yeah. And they may be highly motivated for whatever reason. Maybe it's a health reason, but most people cannot. So when it comes to uh, changing your diet, you, you shouldn't just stop everything you're doing and start a brand new way of eating. Yeah, I agree. It's a slow and steady. It's small changes here and there. Do what you can. Um, you know, it is there are the few people in the world that can just change things suddenly. And I think that does take a lot of resources that the average person probably doesn't have. Yeah. So I think if, if someone was interested in this diet, um, 
That's great. Again, I don't know everything and who knows what the truth is and what's good for one person and another person. Um, but I would say for the average person is, you know, don't just jump into the carnivore diet is look at what you're eating, Mm -hmm. start to improve it slowly. Like we just talked about, you know, make small changes to it. Maybe try to decrease the processed foods, try to increase, uh, more whole foods. Um, you know, what, what would you say to someone who, who wanted to come in and change the way they're eating and they're saying, Hey, I want to do the carnivore diet coach, Kathleen, help me out. Um, well, I think I would, um, support somebody through it. Uh, but I wouldn't want to do this long-term. Definitely not. Again, just, we don't know what the risks are. We don't know, um, the sustainability, any other adverse health effects. Um, but if personally, I would just say, like you said, let's look at lean protein. Let's look at whole foods, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, everything in moderation, um, scaling back on those sugar, sweetened beverages, increasing your water, get moving if you're not already, you know, so let's just keep it realistic, you know, do what you can. That's, that's where I would go with it. Yeah. And I, and I agree. I think that's the right approach to take because what's going to happen is if someone jumps right into this, they're going to do it for a few weeks, maybe a month, maybe two months, if they're able to really stick to it, but then it's all going to go away because they're going to realize it's just not sustainable. And they're going to go back to eating their own ways because they, they weren't able to change it in a way that was personal, that they could actually fit and adapt to the lifestyle that they live. And then this diet is, is no longer going to be anything they could sustain. Right. And, you know, that's just, that's why diets don't work because you just go all in and it's not realistic. You know, it's, I personally, I just don't think it's a hundred percent safe to just kind of do this kind of diet. And you just revert right back to what you're doing versus taking one aspect of your diet and changing it, modifying it, and then holding it and then, then switch another thing that's where you see the most benefit. And that's where you see those long-term changes. And that's where you take an unhealthy diet and you're able to change it. And, you know, suddenly it's year two down the road and you look back at all the progress you've made and how different things are now. It's very gradual, very slow process. Exactly. And, and keyword was year two. People don't want to look out two you know, years from now. They want it done now. But the reality is that what you eat is no different than uh, picking up a musical instrument or learning a new skill or going to school. This is something that's going to take a very long time. And it's a process. You can't just change it in a night, in an instant. You have to do it the right way or it's not going to work. And you have to do it in a way that works for you. It's a personalized way. It's not one type of diet. It's your diet, your personal way of eating. And you have to find that out through your own journey. Uh, and with that said, I recommend you getting a healthy coach because that's what Kathleen and the other coaches do. We don't, we try to help people get away from this. I'm stopping what I'm eating. I'm going to try this brand new diet because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You have to do it in a personalized way, have to do it the right way, make slow changes over a long period of time where finally what you're eating becomes your new healthier way. And it's who you are. Yes, exactly. It's, it's a lifestyle, you know, it's not, it's the long term. It's not what we do for the next week or two, just past the holidays. No, it's lifelong. You know, what, what do you want to happen now and later? Do you want to be healthy? Do you want to have the energy and the movement, go play with your kids, grandkids even, or do you just want to be stuck? Perfect. And uh, with all that said, it was great talking to you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. It was an interesting conversation. Looking forward to talking about the next diet and the next podcast. Uh, And I'll talk to you then. Yeah, take care.